This is Xing. I'm the director and lead organizer for Processing Community Day 2019. And um, this is an online info session where we get to talk about the open call for, for Processing Community Day Los Angeles. And I'm really excited to, to have everyone, the organizers from Processing Foundation and also the track coordinators that we invited for this year to coordinate individual theme tracks. And excited to have everyone in the same room and talk to you and um, answer questions from the community. So I'm just gonna briefly um, talk about some of the intentions of the open call this year and how we, how we came to craft um, the open call and, and why it looks the way it looks. Um, so, so I think um, for me, um, after, after being asked to, to serve as a lead organizer for this event, I was really, really excited to, to find ways to, um, to, to, to sort of um, merge different aspects of art coding and activism. And specifically, I'm very interested in like looking at ways to, to create art and coding project through a critical but also playful lens. And um, for this open call, we are really interested in looking for California and Los Angeles based applicants who, who work to empower marginalized communities, um, specifically transgender nonconforming, disabled, neuroatypical, and POC communities um, to apply. And, and I think that um, a, lot of, a, a lot of times in this type of open call process, um, people who are very used to sending open calls and drafting proposals for, for conferences um, usually get prioritized or, or their proposal look look ha has like certain tone and certain voice and certain structure that that looks very clear and and very sort of you know an easy pick and and we we I, I am very interested personally to to kind of um give a little more care and attention to that and look for people who have interesting and um refreshing and also important ideas in their proposals and and work with them instead of like expecting a proposal that that's very professionally crafted, but but more prioritizing like like interesting voices, unique voices that that's empowering to to um, communities that's in Los Angeles. And um, so for <laughs> for the four different tracks we have, um, we're gonna break into different different presentation where each um, track coordinators will will kind of talk to you about what they're thinking, but. Uh, we have this year four separate tracks. Um, the first one is accessibility, disability, and care track, coordinated by Tae Yoon Choi. And the second one is radical pedagogy, um, coordinated by AM Dark and also organized by Dorothy. And um, for Under the Silicon the Beach, it's coordinated by Tiga Brain and Sam Levine. And Epic Play is coordinated by Chandra McWilliams. I should also note that for um, the accessibility, disability, and care track. Um, Johanna Hedva is also going to help as an organizer. And for for each of these tracks, <clears throat> um, we would reserve three separate um, session for for each track. So so total there will be twelve different sessions uh, spreading out across four different tracks. And under each track, there would also be. Um, around four to five different lightning talks. And all of these um, presenter and workshop facilitators will get an honorarium. We're just working out our budget right now. And, and once, once the proposal um, open call closes, we would be able to um, inform you and, and further communicate the next step for that. So is there anything people from Processing Foundation would like to add, Casey, Lauren, or Dorothy? I don't have anything I'd like to add. I think that was really well stated and reflects my view and vision of the event. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, so should we just ease into 
um, the first presentation by Tae Yoon. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, super nice to be in the company of great friends and mentors. So yeah, it's really exciting. Um, I helped organize the first processing community day um, a year and a half ago, I believe, or a year ago. Yeah, and that was a lot of fun. And I'm so happy that uh, Sin has taken on to make this even better. And um, it seems like really organized from the distance. <laughs> I'm very happy about how um, it's building on top of the work that we did. And I'm just super excited about the LA, uh, Los Angeles community and uh, working with the foundation again. So the track is, it's a mix of two separate things. The first is looking at processing and creative coding at large from accessibility standpoint. So accessibility for people with different learning styles, such as non-visual learners, people who might be using screen readers, as well as people who are deaf and hard of hearing, who might need different metaphors and toolkits to learn about um, creative coding, as well as using code to bring um, accessibility and empowerment to the communities that are not aware of the possibilities yet. So it's um, practical accessibility and also using code to open doors for further conversations and collaboration. And the other part is the care, like the notion of a care in terms of code. And this is something that I'm really excited about exploring with the community. Like, is there a way that we could care for each other by coding? And can we find a community that care for others through the act of coding and act of and technology and you know technology is usually used for control of certain machines or certain types of um, the body of people or information but can we use code to care for others so it's a provocative idea um, that I would like to bring to the um, community today and I think processing out of all other types of programming is, is a community that has demonstrated care and um, sort of the sensitivity for diversity and inclusivity of the language at, um, at a scale. So I'm super excited to learn about what other people think about care instead um, in the context of code. And I'm happy to work with um, local activists and community organizers to bring those communities into the space of the community day. Um, I think I'm also excited about um, different practitioners who've been thinking about bringing processing to um, different audiences, so younger audiences, um, audiences with learning disabilities or other kind of types of special needs. And that's a conversation that we should have um, with each other. I'm done. Great. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, so the next one up would be AM, are you ready? I just have to unmute and now I am ready. Um, yeah, uh, thanks Tan. I really, uh, everything that you said really resonated with me. So I'm AM Dark, I'm an artist, a game designer, and um, an activist, an educator. And so uh, thinking about what you were saying about care, I think that that really aligns nicely with how I'm looking at the radical pedagogy track. Um, you know, based on my practice, I'm often in spaces, you know, dominated by, by technology. I teach game design and in the institutions where I've taught that, you know, like many institutions, they suffer from a lack of diversity. And when I'm thinking about these sorts of issues, like the first thing that I tend to bring up is like, okay, well, first you have to create spaces that are inviting for people. And once you do that, you really have to think about like, what is what is the practice of care in that space? And so for me, radical pedagogy means uh, quite a few things, but one of them is, you know, shifting understandings of power and authority in these various environments. Um, 
The other is thinking about students and educators as whole and complex people. So for example, you know, I'm not just in a space as an expert to, to teach game design or teach art and students are not just there to learn that particular um, skill or um, it, in specific theories. Like they're really, everyone is bringing uh, personal and complex narratives and those are, are valuable and should be shared and should be accounted for in spaces. Um, the other thing is particularly thinking about communities is like how do we take knowledge out of specific institutions so that we're not um, just benefiting individual students where their success is already um, maybe uh, uh, situated in these problematic and exclusionary systems, but how can we think about ways that knowledge can benefit families and benefit communities, right, so that we're, we're actually um, dispersing this knowledge and sharing it. So one of the things that I would like to um, bring to processing community is really that focus is focus on community. And, and for me, less maybe a focus on code, but the other side of things saying, okay, well, what kind of communities do we have when we show up to this space? Like who feels welcome, who feels like that they already have, the knowledge that they already have is valuable and worthwhile in that space and can be, can be shared in terms of our practices and the ways that we um, engage with each other. Um, and in terms of examples for that, um, I'm often inspired by, by you know, students who are in uh, spaces of authority, whether that may be traditional classrooms, who are pushing back and who are being critical, not just of the information and content that they learn, but instruction itself. And as an educator, I try to be um, very, try to model vulnerability for my students and model model transparency and so basically um, being in that position of authority and saying I don't know everything here is what I do know and am I effectively communicating that with you am I empowering you to um, be an agent in your own uh, learning and be an agent in knowledge production such that this becomes sort of shifting the accountability just from like one authority, uh, authority figure to being more collaborative and community based so that we're all accountable for a meaningful experience so that, you know, um, people who are new to things feel like they have a voice and a sense of power to say like, this is how I need to understand this. This is the perspective that I bring. And is this uh, space really working for me? Which is something that I think is, is really important um, in spaces that are dominated by technology. Certainly my experience, um, you know, first learning to code, I had a, I had a lot of false starts because of my background and because of um, perceptions, my own self perceptions of my background. And so again, when I think about um, students and, and that can be in like traditional educational spaces or that can be in more informal learning contexts, right? Like this, like when you're doing community learning, community workshops, um, I think about my own voice and what was lost and um, times at which I didn't feel comfortable or didn't speak up because of, of my uh, understanding of whether or not I fit in that space. So when I I think of community day again I really think about well how can we um, how can we make this a space for people who don't necessarily feel like they're supposed to be there how do we make this a space for um, people who are interested but maybe wouldn't necessarily speak up so again just like thinking about it it culturally um, and so there are different strategies for that. Like one of the things I'm really excited about with the radical pedagogy track is thinking about people who teach in ways that aren't formalized and um, are non-traditional. Examples would be um, uh, someone like uh, Seren Sensei, for example, who is a pretty prominent YouTuber and before she was banned off of Twitter, you know, had like pretty extensive Twitter threads about like all sorts of information, like someone who's disseminating knowledge in a very accessible uh, public space, right, but maybe who would not be considered a traditional educator. Um, I'm thinking about people that do organize um, uh, you know, community workshops that bring in folks that, um, you know, don't have maybe like uh, access to 
more traditional institutions, but they're, they're doing um, low income work in their community. They're inviting um, entire families. They're thinking about, again, one of the things I love about um, how this is organized this year is like making sure there's spaces for entire families. So it's not just this sort of like, um, uh, it's not a proponent of individual exceptionalism where one person comes and becomes an expert and then that knowledge is just self-contained. So really um, people who are thinking about ways to um, flatten hierarchies, ways to disperse power, ways to, um, you know, as the adage goes, like knowledge is power. So how do we get the power to the people? How do we share that, um, you know, and make sure that it goes beyond our existing institutions and practices? Like that's what I'm really interested in for this track. I'm done. Thank you, A.M. Um, Dorothy, is there anything you would like to add? No, A.M. covered it all very beautifully. It's perfect. <laughs> I had a, are we going to do questions now or at the very end? Sure. Um, we're doing it in the second half. So, so the plan is to, to go through all the presentations and the last half hours for questions. Thanks. So the next group is Sam and Tiga. Hi. Hi. Um, um, so, so the track we're organizing is called uh, Under the Silicon, the Beach. And the, the title is a sort of, uh, I guess, adaptation of, of an, an old um, pr a pr protest slogan uh, from from May 1968, the sort of students who were protesting in France, uh, they discovered that beneath the paving stones uh, was uh, sand, right? And they used those paving stones to kind of make barricades. And throw at the cops. And throw at the police, awesome. And so the, the, the slogan uh, that they came up with, which I'm not gonna say in French, but the translation of it, uh, one of the translations is beneath the paving stones or beneath, beneath the pavement, the beach. So, so our track is beneath the silicon, uh, the beach. Um, and um, so uh, we're interested in creative practices that can undermine where we are currently with the web, with um, the way that computation is being used for control and governance, lots of overlaps with some of the other tracks and what's been said today already. Um, the work that artists, designers, um, people who are experimenting with code for the first time, um, the way that these sorts of experiments can open up possibilities for other ways we can understand computing and other ways we can use these technologies. Yeah. Um, and so we're thinking a lot about, you know, how software is more and more a force that mediates kind of like all aspects of our lives and in many ways you know, for the worse, but the question that we want to ask is, you know, how, how can we use uh, uh, software for, for other ends, right? So how can we use it for political ends, discursive ends, esoteric ends, aesthetic ends, and how can we use sort of some of the same tools that might be um, uh, in one context uh, used for the sake of like repression uh, in another context uh, be used uh, perhaps as a, a force for, for liberation uh, or for some kind of aesthetic uh, joy or exploration. Um, uh, do you want to talk about some, some examples? Yeah, so we have a, a list of um, ways that this might come about with some examples of like works that we've been excited about and have inspired us from you know, the past sort of decade, I guess. Um, so firstly, like investigating opaque systems. Um, so this is revealing the way that the, our systems work or perhaps producing new data sets about that particular political or um, social phenomena. Our example was uh, Josh Bagley's drone stream where he created an API and a data set around drone strikes in the US that didn't exist before. Uh, another possibility is something work uh, or thoughts about uh, engaging algorithmic disobedience in some way. So an example for that might be um, the project called Ad Nauseam uh, by um, Daniel Howe and Helen Niesenbaum and... Uh, That's right, yeah. And that is a web browser, uh, an extension for your web browser that uh, blocks ads, but it also, uh, it also clicks on ads that it finds. 
so that uh, it sort of completely obfuscates um, your browsing behavior, basically. Um, projects that explore new aesthetics or new uses of the web. And the example we've got here is from Everest Pipkin, who did a project called Cloud OCR that I really loved that was a took photo took of um, photos of the sky and interpreted and ran them through an OCR program interpreting them in text so thinking about environmental legibility and that's just sort of misuse of of technology in a way yeah right? um, uh, but also we're and we're also like you know I guess like really interested in thinking about how we can imagine um, alternate futures that kind of subvert uh, surveillance capitalism so an example for that would be uh, Druve's uh, uh, other net, which is like a totally independent uh, mesh uh, internet that uh, uh, is being set up uh, throughout um, uh, New York. I think, yeah, I think that's, that's it. I think that's us. about it. Yeah, thank you. Awesome, thank you. And the next one is Chandler at Pick Play. Hi, I'm uh, Chandler McWilliams. Uh, so my track is called Epic Play. Um, and <clears throat> the idea behind this was um, kind of responding to the fact that this year the, the day is being organized to, as, as I am mentioned, include entire families. And so hopefully there will be some, some children on site, but also children with their parents and, and entire families kind of engaging with things together. And so the, the Epic Play Track is a place for both adults and children to propose projects and concepts and come and, and work together um, to kind of do some of the political work that a lot of the other tracks are doing, but uh, with a precise focus on how some of these um, hierarchical relationships sometimes express themselves in relationships between children and adults. Um, also coming out of this is the idea that play is, of course, an endemic activity for children, but as, as people get older, play gets colonized by sports and games as being the only ways to understand what play might be. Um, so there's a hope here that we can learn from some of the children taking place uh, in ways that play is not sport and play is not game, and in ways that play um, kind of encroaches on the everyday world and offers roots of escape from that everyday world. Um, so that said, some of the, the specifics of the kinds of projects we're looking for um, might be uh, narrative fantasy, um, group fantasies, um, doing some group theater work where we um, write sketches together and perform those sketches, um, possibly including some software and ways to bring in um, unexpected humor through um, computational means to a situation that might ordinarily be somewhat tense. Um, and then also looking for ways to, to think about how toys is related to play um, and also importantly as a non-sport, non-game uh, kind of thing to help out play um, can be used uh, to that effect. So children of course make toys out of everything they find in the world. Babies notoriously love plastic cups and empty boxes more than any other toy. Um, and I think there's something to be learned there about um, reconfiguring the world around us into objects that can have different purposes. Um, and as many of us have seen in the history of software, that's uh, a key strategy in resistance when it comes to uh, using technology is to find ways that technology will do things that it's not intended to do. So it's another way that play can kind of um, bridge this gap between some of the political goals of each of us individually, apparently, and the conference as a whole, um, is to kind of teach us how to uh, incorporate and engage other modes of resistance. And so specifically, um, I think projects that look at um, difficult or broken relationships between individuals and try to find ways to address those stresses and fractures and, and um, kind of confront them and heal them. Uh, ways to flip or invert hierarchies. Um, as years as an anarchist, um, hierarchies are really easy to challenge until you become a parent. And then there's a constant hierarchy that you have to negotiate and undo, and it's very difficult. So um, this will be a chance to 
find ways to to make kids be bosses and then maybe challenge the idea of bosses entirely. Um, and then of course, uh, thinking like not excluding games entirely, but trying to think of how games might work to um, increase solidarity, um, even in situations of competition. So even though we might be competing for some goal, how is it that competition as a concept has been taken over by certain powers to necessarily be antagonist? And something that we can, we can address is having a, a solidarity among opponents in a game. Um, and then most importantly, uh, how can we use play to resist a concept of work? And I think this uh, touches most importantly on the lives of kids um, when it comes to software and the arts, because as soon as you say the words software, arts, and children, anywhere in the same zip code, people start talking about STEAM um, as this one very specific way to understand how it is that kids might want to learn to code and why they might want to learn to code, which is a very specific pipeline from school to job. Um, and I, one of the, the joys of processing is the way that it's offered a way to resist that and to um, have a relationship to technology that is not about work. Um, and so in this track, we'll, we'll try to increase those, those opportunities to resist work. I think that's it. Thank you, that's wonderful. And, and thanks to, to everyone who, who talked about your individual track. It's really inspiring. And um, I think we can break into Q&A now. I'm going to send this message to everyone in the chat. So if attendees, um, people who are joining this call right now, uh, maybe take a minute. And if you have any questions for the whole group or any individual coordinator or one of the organizers, um, please just post your question in the chat and, and we'll just have, and, and make sure you note who, who the question is for and we'll just take turn and answer the questions. I have a question for Thin. Yeah. I want to go to every one of this. Is that possible? <laughs> um, it's unfortunately not possible <laughs> and it's it's really kind of like trying to find the balance of like you know we want to have more um variety of content there are so many things that we care about and there's all this different track we want to have but then we only have one day so how can we you know have have a good balance of diverse content but also squish it into a limited time um so so one thing I can say is that all the lightning talks for every single track will be recorded, live streamed and recorded. So, so it's something that um, people can watch afterward if you can make it in person. And also um, if for, for the workshop, we, we are going through a discussion on how, how we can collect materials from the workshop and, and document and, and put it out in some ways. But that's, that's something that we're still going through and thinking about. Yeah, but but each um, if you get the the you, you know every ticket um, for entry that you get you you get to like RSVP for two workshop. So so there's four different track and basically four different opportunities to attend workshop and you can you can uh, guarantee getting to two of them. So there's a question for AM. The question is, how do you think the track might address local community and education in relationship between internet and network education? Can you clarify that, Casey? Yeah, can I do a, vo a voice? Um, I just, processing has always been very global. I think we have an idea for this event to focus on local Los Angeles-based community. Um, I mean, clearly we'll know more about the track when we receive applications, but I was wondering on, in your introduction, where your thoughts were on, on that topic. Because um, you, you, gave, you gave lots of examples of both, um, of having the focus on families, um, 
but then also non-traditional educators, for example, people who are educating through social media? Yeah, I mean, I think that that, for me, the relationship is a little bit complex because I, it's weird. For me, I built more of a local community after starting online. So if I speak more from a personal experience being like, um, you know, a poor black woman who was often like the only person in these different spaces that I was in, like spaces of affluence, um, I didn't really realize that I had a community until it was social media and people who were sort of um, essentially teaching in those spaces. And it was once I had access to those spaces that I was then able to seek out like, oh, okay, there are like community groups in my area. So I think that the way I see that, that relationship is that it can be a little bit um, fluid. I think like starting in a space, um, people who are, using social media in that way, um, one of the benefits of, of engaging in sort of online spaces is there's a sense of safety and there's set the sense that you can, um, you know, watch and there's a low barrier to participation and feeling included, which can sort of become a boost to actually becoming more engaged in persons and in local community spaces. At least that was, that was definitely my path. Um, I didn't feel like I didn't feel like I could maybe join community spaces until I had that sense of in, uh, encouragement and empowerment uh, through, I don't think it was just ex specifically because it was online, but um, maybe the methods that people use to teach online, you know, there's like um, voices can seem more powerful, ideas can spread more quickly whereas when you're in a community space even now I've been in spaces like this where you know there the there's a speaker it's IRL and um, hands don't always go up in the air people are internalizing information and they're holding it but it's not until you know maybe you have smaller conversations with someone and you're a little bit hesitant but it definitely takes like several sessions of that um, which can take time and in person you know, maybe you don't show up, maybe you're, you don't become a regular, but, you know, you can follow someone on YouTube, um, you know, and, and get that sense of comfort and feel that sense of, of empowerment a lot more quickly and safely. Um, I also am very interested in, I was reading an article actually a few weeks ago about like how young women in particular are using Instagram now specifically to teach. So Instagram now you can post multiple photos and sort of swipe through, which you didn't have that feature before. And like, there are so many accounts that are just how to's, right? Like you don't have to look online, you don't have to ask a person, but you have this sort of sense of, of safety because someone has decided that they're going to disseminate this knowledge for you in this way. So I think that that is just really, um, it's a starting point that is afforded to folks who just don't feel comfortable showing up to a meetup. And I think that using um, people who are, are making knowledge easily accessible online is, for example, like if we were able to get some of these folks who do this work um, to the event, I think that that would be a nice bridge in bringing communities who um, would benefit from um, using technology in creative ways, but who, again, don't always feel comfortable in this being present, physically present in those spaces. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, may I ask a clarifying question? Um, I've been talking to various people that are really excited about this event, but then they say, like, I'm not already a part of the processing community. So is there can I still be a part of it? And, you know, my answer is yes. But can we sort of elaborate on that point? And maybe what are some starting points if you're coming to this, if you haven't interacted with the processing softwares or the community before, what's a good way to um, approach creating a, a session proposal or talk proposal? That's for anyone. I can, I have a suggestion. Oh, Taeyoon, go ahead. I'll, I'll wait after you're done. Oh, super simple. I, I always, uh, when people want to submit proposals, uh, I always ask people, well, what's most urgent to you? I think a lot of times when you think about, you know, if you're an educator and you're, 
and you're thinking, okay, I want to think a little bit differently about, and as Ian pointed out, how do we include families and in thinking more holistically about how students are learning and then taking that knowledge outside, but also in the, kind of in the engagement with their family. Uh, so then, yeah, you might be, you know, interested in radical pedagogy and, but then, also realizing, well, I want to think a little bit differently. Maybe I want to think about pedagogy and play, you know, differently. So then I might, you know, sign up for Epic Play or I might, you know, propose a lightning talk for that because, you know, it, it could go either way. Either you can kind of stick with the track that you know and that's most urgent to you or you can be a little bit more experimental and say, well, I can actually contribute a type of creative methodology to epic play, for instance, um, or even to, you know, uh, Taeyoon's track on, um, you know, accessibility, disability, and care. Like there's, there's just tons of ways to look at it. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I usually ask, you know, do you, you know, what is most urgent? And then do you want to take an experimental approach or do you want to take more of, I want to add to my knowledge base? Does that help, uh, Lauren? I don't know if that, helps yeah but so did you want to add to that yeah that's great um so yeah i got that question too and i just say like i use processing software about five times a year <laughs> so i'm not an active user of the software so just putting it out there it's not just about the software so it's much more than that i think it's about an idea of what what you try to express with code and computation at large. So even if you have not used processing, if you are coding or if you're interested in coding, I think you're already a part of the community that processing considers or wants to invite you. So let's not be, I'll just focus on the software. But I mean, software is great, by the way. Um, and the other part is that the fact that you are asking that question means that there's a gap for you to fill in this space. There's something that we have not um, already addressed or have made for you that you should feel free to come and fill in. So I think there's um just consider that as an invitation to come and be part of the community. Just adding to that, I think all of us uh, here started out or continue to be like in between disciplines and mixing up lots of different tools and methodologies and, you know, taking some art practices from some disciplines and met messing them up with computing in some way. And so I think we're interested in anybody who's doing that, right? And a lot of the projects we've mentioned and, you know, in most of our work, I think we use lots of different tools. Sometimes it's processing, but often it's not as well. So echoing to you, and I don't think that should hold you back from replying because we're very open to all sorts of um, practices and things. I actually have a question for Sam and Tiga. Is that okay? I have to ask. Um, so it's it's a it's a bit of more thornier question regarding the track, which is you know you, you're engaging in algorithmic disobedience. So let's like kind of focus on that. And I remember uh, listening to a presentation by Mimi on Oahu um, or Anuha, sorry, um, another artist uh, based out of New York. And, um, you know, she brings up algorithmic violence. And so one of the things that I wanted to ask, because you're the, that's one of the more compelling kind of features of the track is how do we disobey? But then what if you're, let's just put it out there. What if your identity prevents you from doing that? You're undocumented, you're trans, you're queer and trans. There's a different type of relationship that you have to visibility and invisibility. So then how would you kind of approach someone who's, I really want to do this. I really want to explore these really kind of um, new world making possibilities that you're talking about in your track. But then there's that, there's that fear. What would you, how would you encourage, um, you know, people new to the software and to this kind of environment and to this community? How would you kind of encourage that? I think the first, the first thing I would of course say is just that we would never encourage anyone to do anything that made them feel unsafe. Of course. You know, uh, and I think it's, I mean, it's a, I think it's a great question and it's a, pr a pretty difficult one to answer. Um, do you have any thoughts? Well, I think there's a lot of different ways to think about disobedience and creative use of software. And, you know, I think communities who, um, 
you know, are vulnerable in different ways, use these technologies in different ways. And so we're also interested in that, right? So how, you know, um, like these platforms are being used to communicate or like people implementing different strategies um, to push back on that. And, and so I think like, uh, although we talk about protest in kind of a traditional sense, right, because we're still drawing on these like old models of like, let's go into the street and, you know, use our bodies. Um, I think that, that that can be a lot broader than, than that, right? Um, but, but also like, of course, like it is just in a way, just like regular protest too. We're just like, it's easier for some people to do it's hard it's harder for other people to do for for a variety of reasons like so many different kinds of reasons right uh and i know uh if johanna would hear she uh, were here she would have a lot to say about that also right um so uh, my own answer is simply that you do what you can do and what you're comfortable doing and that we try to make a space to help you in any way you can you know? um but we've talked about this a lot, Sam. I think also we're interested in like the misuse and sort of like non-commercial use of, of coding and computation and, and, and internet technologies, um, which, you know, isn't overtly uh, protest and disobedience as we understand it, but it's more like trying to think outside of, you know, the economic model for the web that we have as well. So, yeah, I think there's, there's lots to be explored there as well. Hey, um, I have a follow-up um, really to Lauren's uh, question, but I think maybe also related to Sam and what Sam and Tiga were talking about. Um, so one of the things that I'm really interested in um, is this idea of failure, like, you know, you know, both what happens when you try something and it doesn't work out very well for you, um, you know, what happens when like you are, um, you know, part of it, you're practicing activism online and then you get banned, things like that. Or like there's a detriment to your own um, emotional well-being. But I'm also interested in, you know, what happens when people do try to enter communities or try to create and they fail. Like this is something that's really important to me in terms of pedagogy and a, and a strategy I use is like failing in front of my students and like putting myself out there even when I haven't figured things out because I think that that is, you know, one of the critical barriers into, you know, having people actually engage with, you know, anything new, but particularly with technology and particularly with like underserved groups is like, you know, why even do this like there's a higher risk of failure for me and you know maybe like parts of my identity are on the line or even if I succeed you know then maybe parts of my identity are on the line because like now I'm exposed in some way and so I know personally I would be really interested to hear what those stories look like like I want to know why didn't you follow through with this work that you were doing or what was that barrier to you joining that community you know especially like it's very common, even in my own experience, where you want to enter a space, it looks shiny, it looks great, the people seem good, but then when you show up, like you feel alienated, you feel isolated. And, uh, you know, there are people who are doing the work to talk about that. And especially when we go back to, to Lauren's question of like, oh, I'm not part of processing community. Well, like, again, if you are asking that question, right, like there's something here that speaks to you, you know, there's something in these tracks that speaks to you and you don't see an entry point. Well, I want to know why, what's missing. And, you know, like that is a way that as a community we can build and grow. I don't feel like, especially going back to what, what Shin was saying in terms of like not necessarily picking the most polished, you know, submissions, not saying, oh, well, this person's got it all figured out and like they're going to just shine. Like, you know, there are many different ways to shine. And I think one of them is saying, well, here's what I was afraid of. Here's why I didn't. Here's what I tried. Here's what went wrong. And I think that that, you know, showcasing that vulnerability and the struggle is really beneficial to, to everyone. So, you know, just want to throw that out there. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. Um, so we, we got two questions here. Um, one is Emily to all panelists. Are you accepting co-authored proposals? And if so, what recommendations and expectations can you offer? Yes. 
Yeah, totally. Um, I think that's one of the things we're really excited about. I mean, especially thinking about, you know, the, the kind of genesis of this whole thing being like two different fields, kind of finding something in the middle. So we are really excited about proposals that are um, involving more than one person or involving people with different interests. Um, so it could be like your close collaborator, or it could be like picking someone you haven't worked before, with before and seeing if there's something interesting there. Um, what recommendation expectations can you offer to such collaborators? I think maybe I'll let other people talk to this more, but one thing I would really recommend when you're thinking about that, especially for um, with a talk that's a little more clear, you could, you could certainly do a talk together, and we've had that in the past, but if you're doing a session together, I think it's really useful to have um, sort of clearly defined roles for each person, just so you don't end up kind of like doing the same work twice, and also that you can each like shape your role to um, uh, offer the thing that you can kind of do the faster and most excited about. And to add, add to Lauren's comment, our, our recommendation is when, especially in collaborative work, is make sure that there's a consensus on uh, maybe one to two ideas. Sometimes I feel a collaborative collaborators will get together, there's tons of great ideas, but due to time, um, make sure that again, kind of goes back to what do you feel is most urgent and related to the specific track that you're looking at. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's oftentimes a recommendation. Um, yeah, I think this long distance collaboration with people you have not collaborated before are oftentimes very challenging because we, might be saying the same thing, but actually mean different things or vice versa. So what I like to propose is that the collaboration itself should be the goal of collaborating. Um, if you try to learn about other people by uh, collaborating, you will have a great experience regardless of what happens in the end. And I think the, to take away the stress of the presentation and this high profile, you know, event to more of a community day is a way to decenter that stress into the enjoyment of getting to know each other. Um, I do want to add one more thing to what AM was talking about in terms of failure. So when you're learning to code or when you're learning new any skill, failure is so stressful and failure just discourages you from taking the next step. And what is meaningful in that way um, in that context is to make failure into uncertainty. So failure is definite, it's, it's finite, and there's like no returning. But embracing an uncertainty is a way to feed back into the rhythm to actually try one more time. I am aware that one of the processing fellow or one of the groups of fellows are working on this friendly error message, uh, which was something that a um, group of engineers and artists started together a few years ago. And that's a really interesting idea because like error messages are just so frightening to say like, you did everything wrong, everything's gonna fall apart, the world is going on a fire because you wrote the wrong code. <laughs> and that's what it usually feels like. So to say like code as an um, error message is like, hey, by the way, try that. Or by the way, you're doing great, but it's just you had one thing wrong. Like that's a very different approach of language, um, programming as a, a more gentle, language. So I think it could apply for um, tech as well as a, a whole community experience um, and uncertainty as a middle ground between failure and success. Um, I wanted to add one more thing about the sessions and the idea of working with collaborators, um, which is just, I think we would welcome, um, you know, experimenting with the form of what a session could be. Um, you know, I think maybe at first thought you might think of like a workshop or a talk or something like that. But, um, and I think we're excited about things that are interactive, but like a, a session could also be a chance to um, maybe interview someone that you're interested in, uh, like a collaborator you're getting to know or a conversation between the two of you or a debate, or, and maybe there's ways there to also open things up more to the public and think creatively about um, what different modes of participation are there. Are there different ways to, ask questions or share your thoughts besides just raising your hand and, and speaking one by one. Okay, so the next question comes from KJ to Chandler. And it's a more lo logistical question. How do we facilitate a good balance for children 
an adult pair in the session? And can we say we pre-select participants? I think that's a that's a great question, and it's it's a difficult one. Um, the way I'm imagining it is that ideally the proposals will either make clear through their description or make explicit um, who the intended audience is for. So if they're they want to propose a session where they really ideally would have a bunch of elementary school kids, which is a little broad of a net, but you know kids from a certain range or kids in high school or parents and children mixed or just parents, um, just to kind of make that clear in the proposal. Um, I'm not sure if we can pre-select people per se, but we can certainly um, surface all of that in the session descriptions so that we can let people know that if they, if they don't match this intended audience, that they're certainly welcome, but that uh, their experience you know, may, may vary. Um, and I, I think that would be the, the best way to do it. Because um, certainly parents could get a lot out of going to a session that is primarily intended for children. Um, and people who aren't parents um, could have quite a bit to offer um, people who are or other children. You know, there's, there's no reason that we need to um, essentialize any of these features as long as we're just uh, clear and open about everyone's intentions. I think other good things related to both of these questions are some of the constraints that we have. And this is in the, um, on the website, but I, I think it's good to kind of compile it. Uh, the session should be for about 35 people. They can be smaller, but the rooms that we have fit kind of 35 people max, and then the 45 minute time constraint. But I think maybe an, a more important thing to say is that we have lots of kinds of spaces available. We have, um, outside spaces, um, the default space are these classroom spaces that we have that have tables in them that are kind of grouped together. Um, some of those spaces have computer labs and some of, or, sorry, computers on the tables and other spaces are more open. Um, but we can probably have access to other spaces if the um, proposal requires a different kind of space. And just um, one more thing to add to um, the question about the Epic Play Track. Um, I, I agree with Chandler that it's a great idea to be as specific as possible in your proposal. Um, but at the same time, we also like have, we don't really know um, what age group of people and you know, how many families will actually purchase a ticket and attend. The ticket opens on September 1st, and um, it would we'll, we'll go through the whole whole ticketing process um, after that. And and once once that happens, we'll have a better idea of what the age group would be. And and that's you know that's something that we can potentially come back and and communicate with you. And, and maybe we can like you know do some some kind of adjustment based off of what what kind of attendees um, and what age group actually comes. So I, I would say not to worry too much about that at this moment and just, just more focus on working on the idea. So we're close to the end of the hour. Is there any last questions people wanna ask? Uh, Shane, can you go over? Through the calendar uh, briefly, sort of like proposals are due, and then what happens after the proposals are due? Yes. Um, so, so the open call proposals for Processing Community Day Los Angeles is going to close on the last day of August, August 31st. And um, it's a fairly simple proposal. If you just click into the link, you'll see the, the form. You just submit the form and um, by the deadline and we'll, we'll spend uh, the entire month of September as well as part of October to, to go through all the applications and, and figure out um, what, like how to program the whole thing and we'll, we'll get back to you um, around the end of October. And, and the whole programming would be expected to release um, around the end of November.
Okay, so thank you everyone. Thanks for being here and um, please always feel free to email either um, day at processing.org or you can also feel free to reach out to individual coordinator to, to ask specific questions before the open call ends. And yeah, thank you for being here. Are we also encouraging people to use the discourse as well to talk about ideas or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's something that we would also like to do. So um, there's Processing Foundation has a discourse. Um, would you like to kind of describe the, the discourse platform? Oh, sure. <laughs> It's, um, it's a new forum that we started about um, a month and a, I guess about two months ago now. Um, but there's different categories and there's a category there for community. And I think the, such the, the track organizers have started um, different discussions within there. And it's a good place for questions to go on record and answers to go on uh, record. And um, hopefully, um, in addition to this info session, that can be a space for Q&A, collaboration, support, etc. The URL is discourse.processing.org. Yes. Yeah, and uh, to expand on that, I have started a, a topic here um, about the Epic Play track, so people can put questions in there if they want to talk to me. Um, that's a good way to do it. So that's under the, the community category, right? Yeah. 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 Where are you? At the top of the page, um, if you scroll back up, if you click on the cat, oh, if you, sorry, click on the main banner um, image, if you click on categories um, in that top header, that can be an easier way to find the material. Mm -hmm. So I think community is at the bottom. Yeah. So, so what I could do is um, whichever track coordinator, like when you, when you establish a, a discourse thread, I can also add a link on the website under the track um, so that you can just find the, the thread link and, and you can ask any questions. And that's like sort of an open community space for, for Q&A and sharing ideas. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank Bye. You. This has been really great. Thanks Bye. so much. Thank you. Let's have Bye. 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 <laughs> Good Bye. to see you all. That boat Good to see you. awesome. <laughs> oh, my God, look at that. Whoa, look at that. <laughs> <Bye. laughs> Who goes into the boat? All right. Bye. Okay.